Good morning. We just watch and hear the parties in the other room. <laughs> How's everybody? Bills shut out last week? Yeah. Expected a bigger response than that. Oh. Yeah, I was actually in the car. We were, uh, Sunday after church, uh, my wife and I went down to Pittsburgh to spend a little time with our daughter, our son-in-law and granddaughter. And so my wife was keeping me updated in the car on the way. So now if the bills fall behind in the score, I have to get in the car and drive <laughs> so that they do better. Uh, I hope that's not true. Um, we're talking about vision and values. Last week we talked about we endeavor to make our space a safe place for people to find faith. Today I want to talk about how we endeavor to make our space a safe place for people to find friends. Oh. There are some people who actually don't want friends. Um, people who feel like they're pretty self-sufficient and don't need anyone. Or people who feel like they don't deserve anyone. There have been voices in their life that told them how little they are and how much they are lacking, and so they just assume they don't deserve friends. And then there are people who they've had friends, but those friends hurt them and betrayed them, and they don't think they want any more friends. There is no form of biblical spirituality that isolates you from others. We find it in the opening pages of Scripture and it goes right through. It's, 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 not, it's unrelenting in this truth. God is, is creating the universe and every day he gives his own evaluation and assessment of his work and every day he says it is good, it is good, it is good until one day he says it is not good. It is not good for a person to be alone. Even Jesus, when he teaches us the Lord's Prayer, the very first word reminds us that we are in a community. It's not my Father, it's not the Father, it's our Father. We belong in this together. And we know that friends are actually good for you. Friends are good for your health. You actually live longer with friends than without friends. Having friends has more effect on your life expectancy than your weight or other habits you can have that the doctors constantly tell you you should not do. Friends help you to encourage healthy behaviors. They, they provide emotional support. They, they help you when you're undergoing seasons of stress. They, they encourage you to be your very best. So in the Christian faith, we're not called so much to find friends as to be friends. Now, I, I know some of you are hearing this this morning and you're going, oh, dear Lord, I, 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 I don't want to have to be responsible to go out and make friends. That's not what this is about. And this actually isn't a burden being imposed on you. It's a freedom being given to you. We're not called to go find friends. By the way, anybody, just, just check sometime. If somebody comes up to you and they said, I'm looking for a friend, will you be my friend? How do you feel about that, really? Not so positive. Not so positive. Without friends, our hearts actually become hard, our souls become brittle, our spirits begin to de uh, deteriorate. Uh, friends have as much influence on the outcome of our life as, as our education does. And there are actually stories in scripture where friendship is the single thing that preserved a person's heart from being pierced and completely overcome by evil. Yeah. Uh, David, who would become the second king of Israel, developed a very close friendship with uh, uh, a man named Jonathan, and that friendship preserved his heart. Jonathan's father was the first king of Israel, and he attempted personally on multiple occasions to end David's life, and then used the military resources of the nation to try to hunt him down and take his life. And it would have been very easy for David to become very vengeful and, and very discouraged and, and very angry, and yet he doesn't become any of those things, and it's because he has a friend. So what makes a good friend? Well, <clears throat> someone who's trustworthy. There, there's a correlation between the things that they say and the things that they do. Uh, someone who's honest. 
Like they won't lie to you and they won't lie about you. Someone who's loyal. And what that means is, is they're not going to allow you to be redefined by a mistake you make or what someone else says about you. Their relationship is intact with you. Someone who's, who has empathy. They, they can sense what you're going through and they enter that season with you. Someone who listens because we don't feel we belong if we don't feel we are heard. Someone who rejoices when good things happen. Have you ever shared good news with somebody and you felt like you were, you were frustrating them or discouraging them because the same good thing hadn't happened to them? Someone who mourns when painful things happen to us. Someone who is self-confident. They don't depend on you for their identity. These are powerful things. Someone who sees humor in life. I mean, granted, there's not a lot to laugh at these days, but aren't you glad for the people who find something that's funny still? You know, those things matter. In the Christian faith, in the Christian faith, we're not called so much to find friends as to be friends. Finding friends is a backwards approach to life, at least according to Jesus. Being a friend is how healthy and life-giving relationships are established. And you may be surprised by who responds and who doesn't respond to your effort to be friendly. Now, many people, when they're looking for friends, they look for someone who's a lot like them. <clears throat> Two basic, there's two basic shortcuts to friendship in our world. Both of them disappoint us. And the first is to look for someone who's a lot like us. Someone who's about the same age. Someone who's about the same relationship status. Uh, if, if we have kids, we look for people who have kids. I mean, if you have kids, you don't really look for people who don't have kids because they don't get your life at all. And if you don't have kids, you don't look for people who do have kids because you're not ready for those little crosses to bear yet. You're not going to do that. You look for people with about the same kind of education, about the same kind of income. You want to be able to do or not do the same things. And this is a very common approach to finding friends. And it is often disappointing because if sameness is the basis of the friendship, then how much freedom do you have to be different at all? What if you change your mind, change your opinion? What if your circumstances change? And this happens all the time. Your relationship status changes, and all of a sudden people who were friends are not. Your income level changes and people who were your friends are now not your friends. Why? Because they were connected by sameness. There's another shortcut to friendship in our culture and that is to find fault with someone else and find humor in it. And so if you can kind of poke fun at other people, you'd be surprised how quick some people will get together. But the problem is, is that people will do that to you, not just with you. And that's not really a great basis for friendship. We don't have to be the same. The followers of Jesus weren't the same. You couldn't get much different than those individuals were. Peter was a loud and impulsive person. My favorite verse in the Bible about him is on the Mount of Transfiguration. It, the Bible says, Peter did not know what to say, so he said. That's Peter. He abhorred silence. Someone needs to be saying something. I might get it wrong, but at least it won't be quiet. His brother, Andrew, actually was a spiritually interested person and a follower of John the Baptizer before he became a follower of Jesus. He's the one that introduced Peter to Jesus. Andrew's not at all like his brother. He's a little bit more reserved, a little bit more background. We don't hear a lot about him in Scripture. James and John were known as the sons of thunder. Short fuses these guys had. Cross them and it gets loud and pretty direct very quickly. Philip brought Nathaniel. Nathaniel was the guy who went from a very severe skeptic to a complete believer in one conversation. How many know? Not everybody goes that fast. Um, Matthew was a tax collector responsible for extracting taxes from people who were in Israel in order to support the Roman occupation, something they did not want or desire, and fund that. Thomas was more known for his doubts than his faith. Judas was self-serving and dishonest. And this is what's interesting about Judas. He didn't just want Jesus to be king of his heart. He wanted Jesus to be 
king of the land because he was pretty sure that if Jesus was king, given his close association, things would work out pretty well from him. So Judas had some political uh, agendas, and when Jesus didn't meet those agendas, he wound up betraying him. By the way, any time, any time our political preferences or agendas take priority our, over our faith, we will eventually betray Jesus. No one is the exception to that rule. Very different disciples and uh, very, very different kind of community. And it was the most important kind of community they had ever been a part of. They often didn't agree. They sometimes didn't get along and not a single one of them would have it any other way. At the end of his life, Judas actually commits suicide. And the automatic assumption is it's just he feels so guilty for what he did to Jesus. And to be sure, he does. But there's also the loss. He broke every single close relationship he had with that single action. And he couldn't imagine life without his friends. The concept of friendship in the community of Jesus is different than it is in our world. And if we try to take the world's processes and make that our basis of friendship, we will not experience anything different in church than we do outside of church. Some people just want friends so that they will feel better about themselves. It's just a way to use other people. You know, you make me feel good if I'm around you. If I'm around you, you're the kind of person that can open certain doors for me. I, at least you don't embarrass me. But what happens when they can't open doors? What happens when they do embarrass you? Proverbs 17, 17 puts it this way. It says, a friend loves at all times. A friend loves at all times. A brother is born for a time of adversity. Love at all times. What does that mean? That you feel wonderful? I'm not going to ask anybody to respond. Don't just put your best poker face right, right on right now. Stare straight ahead. If you have to, put on sunglasses. I don't want you giving away a single thing. But married people in the room, have you always felt exactly the way you did the day you got married? Nope. You have not. It, feelings fluctuate. The Bible doesn't say a friend feels the same at all times. A friend loves at all times. And love basically says, I want what's best for that person no matter what. And I will speak truth, but I will do it in a loving way. That I will try to support that individual in every way I possibly can. Last week we learned that God is for us. This week we're learning that we need to be for each other. Does that sound like a good idea? How, how many, it's okay if some people are for you. Yeah? How many it's okay if you are for some people? Yeah, that's a healthy way to go about life. A friend does a couple of things. A friend learns to let others in. Let others in. Now, there can be a little bit of risk involved, but not as much as we fear. And we'll throw out little clues from time to time to let people know certain things about us. And so you all know that I'm a Bills fan. And I'm not a Bills fan that just became a Bills fan after the Bills finally made it to an AFC championship game last year. I've been through hell and back with this team. <laughs> well, I've been through hell and partly back with this team, and we'll see how it goes. You know, you throw that out there, and you'd be surprised how many people just roll their eyes and look at me like I'm some kind of, of, of strange individual in a, in a barren land. You know, why would you, why would you be a, a Bills fan? But there's other things that we can share besides our taste in music or besides our, our favorite foods or besides our favorite sports teams. We can share the things that we struggle with. You would be surprised how many doors that open when you let people in? That little bit of vulnerability. You say, well, it won't impress anybody. The goal of friendship is not to impress people, it's to connect with people. You, just, you can just share a little bit of what you're struggling with or share some of the things that you're hoping for. Like, it would be great if something like this would happen in my life. That's letting people in. Jesus told his disciples that they weren't just servants. They were his friends. This is what he says in John 15, 15. I no longer call you servants. Why? Because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I have learned from my father. I have made known unto you. I have let you in. 
A friend lets other people in. A friend also puts other people first. Rather than demanding our own way, we look for ways to support others. Two verses earlier in that same chapter of John 15, this is what Jesus says. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for his friends. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for his friends. I have a friend who's a pastor who came to visit our church. This is pre-COVID. And he lives out in the New York City area. And he is a New York Jets fan. So he knows some of my pain, because that's not been a great team either. And he came to our house after services. He was a guest speaker that day. And that day, on our television, I put on the New York Jets game. <laughs> Greater love has no man than this. <laughs> <laughs> the Bills were playing and the Bills were winning, but I watched the New York Jets game. Why did I do that? Because I put someone else first. I get to watch lots of Bills games, but I don't get to have a friend in my house like that every single Sunday. And I wanted it to be a special day. For Does this make sense to anybody? Like we put other people first. Not everyone responds the way that you want them to, but I can tell you this, even if they don't respond the way you want, here's what's true. God has a plan for their life and you don't know what it is. We have to get out of the mode of trying to control people and their outcomes because that just destroys relationships. I mean, I do premarital counseling, which is wonderful because two people believe that they are madly in love and want to spend the rest of their lives together. And then I do marriage counseling where people are not so sure that that commitment is still there. And on occasion, some of the things that are the underlying tensions that are tearing the marriage apart is that a person doesn't feel supported. They feel like someone's trying to control them. It won't work in marriage and it won't work in any other relationship of your life either. We don't know what God is doing in their lives. We don't know what God's plan is, but we can be supportive of what God wants to do in their life. And we can be supportive of their ability to discover that and lean into it and become who God created them to be. A friend loves at all times. In Acts chapter two, we're told something really remarkable, beginning in the 42nd verse. It says they, meaning the church, devoted themselves. What did they devote themselves? Because devoted is a very powerful word. It doesn't just say they appreciated. It doesn't just say they preferred. They devoted themselves. What did they devote themselves to? The apostles' teaching and to fellowship, the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being uh, saved. The church had a loyal, faithful, and true, steadfast commitment to the teaching of God's word, to conversations with God that change the world and to fellowship. Question. Are you as devoted to fellowship as you are to learning God's word? Are you as devoted to fellowship as you are to prayer and conversations with God? Fellowship is the biblical approach to friendship. That's what it is. It's far richer in meaning than just friendship. It's broader and it's deeper. If I were to define or describe fellowship, it would include these three things. One, the share you have in something like, uh, maybe you own stocks, maybe you don't. But if you do own stocks, as a rule, you buy them. 
you actually have to invest in something. And so you own a share, or maybe more than one share. Are you invested in fellowship? Secondly, secondly, it is the interest you share with someone, a common interest. What do you share with them? In the church of Jesus, in the family of Jesus, the interest we share is that we want every single person on the face of the planet to experience the grace of God for themselves. That's what brings us together. What brings us together is not that we all like the same food or we all like the same teams or we all like the same colors or we all like the same music or we all like the same dress styles. I mean, just look around. There's a lot of diversity in how we decide to dress on any given day. And this is what is true. Those are not what draw us together. What draws us together is that there are still people who have no idea how much God loved for them or how much he paid for their lives, and, they, and we want to make sure that they have an opportunity to know. How many here could celebrate this morning that there are people who still want people to experience the grace of God for themselves? Amen? <clears throat> and then it's the gift you share with someone. So it's the share you have, your investment, it's the common interest that you share, but it's also the gift that you share. You say, well, pastor, I don't have anything to share. That is not true. The Bible says every single one of us have a gift to share. Maybe you don't know what it is yet, but every single one of us have a gift to share. And you might say, well, in this season of my life, I do not have a gift to share. My resources are less than I actually need. And because of physical challenges that I'm facing, I don't really have a way to help anyone in a physical way. And because I'm struggling so much emotionally, I can't really be very supportive of other people in this season of my life. Your need is your gift. Your need is your gift because there are people that God has resourced with words of encouragement and prayers that make a difference and financial resources and emotional support and God has placed them all over the place and they just need someone to be able to help with their gifts and when you come in, you are the gift that activates their gift. Is that not a good thing? Everyone has something to share. Our prayer for someone can be a gift. Our willingness to listen, just that time we take, the gift of time is such a valuable commodity in our day and age. The Holy Spirit has something for you to share with someone else, and the Holy Spirit has something for you to receive from someone else. That's what fellowship is. I thought fellowship was, was eating together. A lot of people make that mistake. But in Acts, the second chapter is said that they were devoted to fellowship and eating together, so they must not be the same thing, or, or Luke is being redundant. They ate together and they ate together. That's not what he's saying. There's something else going on. The meal was a good reason to share a table. But the Holy Spirit had things he wanted to share across the table when people gathered together. And here's the thing. It is very easy to refuse a gift from the Holy Spirit because I am not friends with that person yet. So the question is, are you able to receive a gift from someone that God chose to give to you? Are you able to give a gift that God chose to give through you? Let's have the worship team come out. The church and the way we think about friendship, if we do it biblically, is quite different than our world. Biblical friendship isn't about what I can get from someone. It's more about what I can share with them. In the Christian faith, we're not called so much to find friends as to be friends. And so this morning, I'm not asking how many friends you have. 
I'm not asking what the quality of those relationships are. I'm asking if you're willing to let go of the usual constraints that our culture has taught us and imposes on us. I had, uh, well, I went to the hospital to see a person. She's in her 90s, and she was not doing well. And I was able to get in. I was grateful for that, because these days you never know. And she told me a story about a friendship that she developed with someone in our church family. And it's a young man who is a college student. He's at university. And I was so impressed. How does a, a 90-something woman develop a friendship with a 20-something guy? And she told me the story. She was sitting in a coffee shop waiting for some friends to show up. And she recognized him from the church. And when he walked in, she said, hi. And he came over and he sat down and he said, he said, I don't have anybody to talk to right now. She said, I'm here. And he told her something that he was really, it was painful in his life. It was difficult. And she listened. It's, it's such a gift. And she said a quick prayer. She didn't embarrass him. She didn't take up the whole day. And then, I love this too. She's in her 90s, but she knows how to use a computer. And she doesn't use her age as an excuse to disengage from culture, you know. And they've been sending each other emails. She's been supporting emotionally, praying for, encouraging, and rejoicing when good things are happening in his life. And they are. That is the church. That's what friendship and fellowship can look like. Not somebody who just looks like me but someone that God has brought into my life for this season. Heavenly Father, you have been a friend to us. We are grateful. Teach us to be good friends to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand.